Welcome to the seventh class of the Popular Resistance School, How Social Transformation Occurs. This particular class we're going to talk about infiltration. Very challenging issue. Uh, infiltration and informants are a common problem throughout the history of movements. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope that at the end of this uh, class you'll be able to tell the difference between what an infiltrator is and what an informant is, right. what their various roles are. And you'll have to be able to identify infiltration and find ways to deal with it, both to prevent it, uh, to mitigate it, and to confront it if it's necessary. So let's just start with some broad definitions of what an infiltrator is versus an informant. An infiltrator is someone who's from outside of the movement. So they could be from a law enforcement agency, a corporate security, an opposition group of a some political sort. political party. Right, exactly. And, um, and infiltrators are sent into the movement to gather information, to cause div division or disruption within the movement, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. An informant is usually somebody who comes from the movement. So this is, um, you know, an activist who may be turned into an informant. Perhaps it could be because they need money. Perhaps it could be because they're facing some sort of legal consequences. And this is a deal that they made uh, that they would become an informant in, in order to avoid jail time or large work, fines. Work, work off their sentence. Exactly. Uh, and just on the first point of infiltrators, I just add that this doesn't have to be a law enforcement official or right. a professional uh, corporate security person. This could be uh, an amateur. It could be someone that... The police has a political ideology, has a political or, ideology and, yeah. uh, or has been approached by the police or being paid by police mm -hmm. uh, to do this job. So it doesn't have to be a professional police officer. So let's we'll start with some cautions. Right. Um, the first is don't avoid reality. Right. Um, if, don't, don't be in denial. Uh, don't believe you can't be infiltrated. Yeah. Almost every movement has been infiltrated at some point. Uh, and so just realize it's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. And, don't and, jump to... I mean, even in a small group, yes. because an, a skilled infiltrator um, can often make themselves one of the most, you know, trusted people or, you know, active people within the organization. And so even in a small group, it may be that somebody is an infiltrator. You have to just keep it on that list of we'll do, possibilities. We'll, we'll give some examples of that. Yeah. And, and, and if there is a suspicion of being an infiltrator, don't have an emotional response about it. Right. Uh, don't just get angry, have a big fight in front of the group. Just yeah. be aware of it. Observe it, start to record about it, and you start to develop your case uh, and, and really understand whether you're being infiltrated or not. It, it can cause a lot of damage um, if you don't deal with it properly. So it is really important to step back and think about it, work with others on a, on a real strategy to protect your organization. And then you also really want to avoid paranoia. Yeah. Uh, you don't want people thinking that everyone is an, oh, there's an infiltrator. Who's the infiltrator? Who's the infiltrator? Yeah. It's just, it's, it, even though infiltration is common to movements, it's not common uh, everyday experience of the movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you just shouldn't assume it. You shouldn't, uh, just the opposite of the, op the first point. Right. Uh, you shouldn't ignore it. You also shouldn't assume it right. and create paranoia among the group. And so it's really important that before you make any kind of accusations, you have facts to back them up. Right. Yeah. Although it does remind me of... Um, one of the action camps that we participated in around pipeline fights where kind of at the outset um, there was just like a statement made like, you know, yes. if there is law enforcement, you know, infiltrators here, welcome. We hope you'll join our cause. You know, it's just kind of like recognition that it's a possibility, but yeah, not taking it too seriously. There are, there are, there are instances actually where infiltrators do change sides. That they, they get involved in the movement and they learn it and they it's rare so yeah. i'm not saying that should be your strategy but right it, yeah it, definitely it, 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 it does <laughs> we don't happen. believe that we're going to appeal to the moral you know values of our oppressors but and just to, to talk generally about dealing with infiltrators uh, it really is rare to get the proof right. uh, it, uh, and so you, you, you someone could be acting like an infiltrator almost doing the infiltrator's work but not be an infiltrator right they, right. could, they could have they could have just uh, some kind of personality problem, some emotional problem. They could have Whatever, some, some addiction issues, motive. some alter. Who knows? And so you may not be able to prove it. And so and most of the time, I think we don't. We're not able right. to approve, approve it. And so many what you'll hear through this lecture tonight uh, is uh, today is that you'll uh, if you take certain actions to run a good group, you will be doing good things that are just good for the practice of how to organize a, a movement. Right. Uh, and it may have also has a positive effect of dealing with infiltration, but the main purpose is organizing a good movement. Yeah, and so 
um, while you need to be realistic about the possibility of infiltration, when things start to happen, um, have that as just one of your things on your list, but also look at what are some other possibilities that could be causing the things that you're seeing. You could have some, someone could put someone on Facebook or social media that tipped off the police. Yeah. Uh, that can happen unintentionally. Yeah. Uh, so there's lots of, and there's all sorts of ways they can these days spy on our phones, spy on our... Right. The whole group could be surveilled right through our computer of, or our phone. They don't even have, necessarily have to put a person into the organization that's anymore. Right. There are, that's a whole other discussion of how to protect ourselves from that. We're not going to get into that tonight, to this right. class. Right. But there are ways to protect yourself from that, too, uh, to stop the technological uh, infiltration. So one of the ways that we, um, you know, want to deal with infiltration is to have discipline with our, within our own organization. Um, this can be such a sensitive subject. So if you accuse somebody of being an infiltrator who's not an infiltrator, that can cause such division and damage to the trust within your organization because then other people start thinking, oh, wow, do they think that I'm an infiltrator too? Or, you know, is this person or whatever? And so, um, so just... Before you accuse someone of being an infiltrator, make sure that you have proof um, that you know that they are, or as close as you can. And that even means not just like making a public accusation, but even spreading rumors. Right. Uh, even gossiping. Or joking. Uh, or joking. Uh, yeah. These are these are not funny jokes. Yeah. Uh, and I think if people start to make those kind of jokes or spread that kind of gossip, they need, the people making those claims need to be confronted. Yeah. And so that's just not appropriate to explain why. Yeah. Why it's undermining the group, why it's uh, causing division. We don't need to have that kind of thing, uh, you know, uh, going on in our in our group. Yeah, and, and never go public about somebody, you know, saying that they're an infiltrator uh, until you've gone, we'll kind of outline the steps of what you do when, when you have gotten to the point where you really are strongly believe that someone is an infiltrator. But again, it just, it hurts the 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 it creates a toxic environment within the organization it create it creates distrust and we're trying if you look at our grand strategy we're trying to build trust we're build, trying to build internal cohesion and this can really disrupt that it can also take somebody who wasn't an infiltrator and make them think well they think I'm an infiltrator so now I will become one because they can know? react in anger about being accused right and you can create a self-fulfilling prophecy and help the police get an infiltrator or they can become an informant yes you know? yeah so what are kind of some general indications that you may have an infiltrator in your organization if previously your organization was operating smoothly and suddenly things start to go wrong um, that may be a sign that someone new you know who's come into your group is an infiltrator and we had that problem very early on in uh, the Occupy movement in Freedom Plaza, yeah, Occupy Washington D.C. When we were doing a protest at the Air and Space Museum, that was like the second day or and, something. That's yeah. right, and it was a anti anti drone protest. Right, and there was a drone exhibit at the Air and Space Museum where people would go and do a die in. Right, under the peaceful drone. banners, P banners, die-in. chants, a die in at the drone exhibit. Yeah, uh, and uh, it didn't turn out that way. No. Uh, Right. As they were, um, there was a group that went, you know, marching down from Freedom Plaza to the Smithsonian, and as they started to come up the steps to go into the museum, I think one or two people, like, rushed ahead of the whole group, rushed the guards, caused the guards to panic, they started pepper spraying, people in the march got pepper sprayed, people who were just there at the museum, including some young teenage girls, uh, were pepper sprayed, and nobody actually even made it into the building. That's right. So the protest was taken off track by some infiltra in, in, infiltrators who intentionally disrupted and, and misled the group into the wrong tactic. Right. Uh, and, and and they did it intentionally. Yeah. Uh, and so that created some suspicion. And that, that suspicion was added to uh, when that's the, the p same people who were involved in that. Yeah, it was a few nights later. Right. And um, our permit had run out. We had gotten a permit for the first four days just to get our medic tent and media tent. Put our, in, put our infrastructure in. So when we knew that the permit would run out and we're intended to stay much longer, but we wanted to make it harder for them to remove us. Right. And we don't typically get permits for protests. We believe that the First Amendment is our is our permit for, for a right. protest. But um, so we were at this point where the permit was running out and there was this question of whether the police were going to arrest us or not. 
And some of the people in the Occupy camp came up to us that evening and said that this particular person was talking to them about when the police come or if the police come, we should, you know, confront them and right. and, and be more aggressive. And so we confronted that person, actually, and ended up asking him to leave uh, the camp. And then a couple, it was after that yes. that uh, it came out a right-wing... A right-wing uh, a writer wrote for a conservative publication how proud he was to infiltrate the Occupy encampment in Washington, D.C., and yeah. was able to take us off track at this drone and describe the drone protest and what he had done. Yeah. So we did, it was confirmed. But, you know, that's a good example, though. Even without knowing the person was an infiltrator, we just took the normal... Because of his behavior. ...approach of saying, hey, your behavior is not right. Right. We're not looking to have a fight with the police. We're not going to be uh, getting into a conflict. Right. We have not consensed we'll pro- on that we're, as a group. We're, we're, we're gonna, we're, the group has decided to protest and not go easily. We're going to... Hold do, our ground. Do a, hold our ground. But we're not going to look for a fight with the police. Yeah. yeah. And so you're, you're just not telling people, what, you know, you're going against the group's decision. Yeah. And that's not acceptable. And the person left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another sign may be if the opposition seems to know what you're doing ahead of time. Uh, we saw that on Freedom Plaza as well. Yeah. Um, I think there were times when or there was one march in particular where or one action where we had decided in our direct action group that we were going to have most of the people marching down one route to the location and a smaller group of people who were going to go inside were going to take a, a less obvious route. And we were hoping that the police would be distracted by the large march and not notice the smaller group. And um, as the small group started heading out, um, we noticed that police cars were following us and then police on bikes following us. <laughs> and it's pretty obvious that they knew where we were going and, and what we were doing. Um, also, just taking an action off track. Um, we also had where too? people yeah. had planned an action yep, that's right. and they were all set to go off and do this action and someone came rushing in and very convincingly got them to go off towards a different direction to a different action and just that whole action fell apart. Yeah. And then, of course, the issue of disruption. Mm-hmm. As we'll talk about later, one of the goals of infiltrators is to disrupt and divide the movement. So if you start to see that kind of disruption, then you start to have suspicions. And again, we saw that occupies an example we come to all the time because it's a long protest. We know that the police, the FBI, Homeland Security, and local police were meeting on a regular basis to decide how to deal with Occupy. And infiltration was, I think, common throughout the movement. Well, we know from the beginning that they were occupying, like we were up in Occupy Wall Street in Zuccotti Park the first day. And as we were leaving the park, um, we were driving around the back of it and we were stuck in traffic and there was a white van next to us parked. And when they opened the side door, you looked in and saw two police officers sitting in the front seats. And we saw two men come out in civilian clothes with backpacks. Baseball cap. Yeah, and and I... Photographed them as they walked around and into the into the crowd. So right the from the first day of Zuccotti Park, they were in, they, they infiltrated. Yeah, uh, and we and we saw it. You know, we saw it actually happening. Yeah, uh, and of course, uh, our opponents do have a history. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the history of infiltration is very common in U.S. Uh, political movements. Uh, they've affected every political movement since the early part of the 20th century, with the whole Red Scare up and through to COINTELPRO. The COINTELPRO, which is a massive effort that was ongoing for years by the FBI, counterintelligence COINTELPRO. Mm-hmm. And then we saw it in the, with the Black Panthers, we saw it with the environmental movement, we've seen it with uh, uh, food rights, with uh, animal rights, mm-hmm. uh, we've seen it with uh, women's movement, peace movement. Yeah. It's hard to think of a movement that has not been infiltrated. Civil rights. It's yeah, just I'm a sure. very common pro- civil rights, that's yeah. right. Uh, it's a very common tactic used. And so, uh, when, when your opponents have a history of infiltration, you guys just be suspicious as possible. Right. Other things is um, if you have new members that are behaving in a way that seems out of place, um, that could be infiltration. Um, out of place meaning taking you off track or doing something opposite the, the group is asking planned questions, on, asking yeah. questions. Is also, we'll yeah, talk about some when examples. We were, um, at one of the Spokes Council meetings to organize the inauguration protest, the J20 protest, right. and... Um, people were breaking into groups to plan various things they were going to do. And, and one guy that just like came out of left field, and I can't remember what the issue was that he wanted everybody to organize around, but it was totally not related to like what yeah. we were doing. And I remember just thinking, uh, that guy's acting like an and we, and we, and we know from the J20 trial, trials, they were there. Yeah. And they were filming. Yeah. Uh, and, and trying to use that evidence to prosecute people later. That's right. 
So let's talk about some common tactics that infiltrators use. Let's uh, start kind of with some broad categories, and then we'll go into more specifics. And one broad category is gathering information. Yeah. Uh, and it's gathering information on protests, gathering information on finances, all sorts of different things. Who are the participants? Yeah, building, in fact, building profiles of the participants. Right. Uh, picture. Getting photos of them. And getting uh, a little bio data. Mm-hmm. Their weaknesses. Uh, how you can go get get go after them, provide that information because it's a, it's not just one infiltrator; it's a team. Right. Those infiltrators, you know, who are in the camp, go home at night or go back to their offices and meet with their team. Right. And discuss the group. Right. So. And so they may try to look at uh, weaknesses of people within the group that they can exploit to create anguish and division within the within the organization. Um, Part of that information gathering is becoming your best bud. That's very common. It's and becoming very a relation, even a sexual relationship. Even a sexual or romantic relationship, yeah. uh, becoming your close friend, uh, giving you rides home, giving you uh, marijuana to smoke with them, or share going out for drinks, or yeah. just becoming your and, and becoming very reliable. That's becoming someone one. who you can count on who will do the good work. Right, and. Um, as we said, with that information gathering, they are providing that information to law enforcement or corporations or other opposition, political opposition that you may have. Another broad category is just causing internal dissent within the organization so that you're spending so much time dealing with that that you can't actually work on the cause that you're supposed to be, you know, you're there to work on. Um, two, so, go ahead. Two kind of ways that they do that. One would be to um, make a false accusation about someone or something and then turn around and expose that as being a false accusation and then it causes a real riff within the group as people argue over that, or they that could, situation. Or, or, or they're spreading rumors about different people. Right. Uh, I remember doing Occupy late in Occupy where we were very heavily, I think we were definitely infiltrated pretty seriously. Yes. Uh, there were all sorts of lies being told about us. Even and though it, you know, even though we slept on the on the uh, encampment yeah. every night, yeah. one of the lies was that we went to a hotel every night. Right. And even even and people at the camp who saw us sleeping believed it. Right. It was just so bizarre. I mean, it was just it, the, the lies. It was, or it seemed to believe. Maybe they were maybe they were infiltrators, just like exactly. Who knows? We'll never know. But um, one thing that really tips you off off is like when lies start being told, yes. and you try to correct the lies, and it doesn't matter. They just come up with new lies. And that was very common. Then you can tell that, oh, this is not really about truth. This is about causing disruption. So, um, And then another is just disinformation. So um, maybe someone from your opposition or law enforcement may tell someone within the movement that they have an infiltrator in there. And then that causes division within the organization as everybody starts looking at each other. Like, who's who's the infiltrator and distrusting each other yeah, um, so that yeah. itself can be divisive so the police can spread rumors that they have an infiltrator right and that just causes people like getting all paranoid and suspicious yes so let's move into some more specific actions that infiltrators will take a very common one is what they volunteer for mm-hmm. if you remember what their goal first goal is is gather information they're going to volunteer for things that can gather information. Right. They want to gather information on your finances. Oh, I do bookkeeping. Let me help with, let me help with the finances. Right. Uh, they, they do... Uh, membership uh, lists. Membership lists are very, you know, I, I, I do database management. I can, I can handle that. Right. Uh, or they can get involved in planning protests. Right. Uh, becoming part of a planning committee. And, and Typically in your direct action group, yeah. Your direct action And some things as simple as uh, taking out the trash. Right. Because if you're putting uh, confidential or, or, or important material in the trash, right. they'll take that material and bring it back to the office and review it. Exactly. Um, I remember early on in Occupy when this young man came to our media tent one night and said that he was from Occupy Wall Street and that he was going around from Occupy to Occupy to gather contact lists of people involved so he could create this network and he wanted me to give him a copy of our contact list and I was just like no, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> no idea who you and, are. And it's just a, that's not an infiltration reaction. That's just a best judgment reaction. Exactly. Like giving people's contact information out without their permission is, is wrong. Right. Uh, you, and, and you should, so you, it's just, sometimes it's just having good practices for your movement. And, right. and that's we'll another, that. that's another good point is this next bullet. Uh, you know, you want to, uh, Listen to how kind of how people ask questions. Right. You want to be aware of what people are doing, and so if they're asking probing questions about things that aren't they aren't really working on. Right. Yeah. Why do they need to know that? Why are they curious about that? What's going on here? 
um, having money. So maybe they are part of the movement and you don't see them having a job, but they seem to always have money or they may be using that money, taking people out to buy drinks or things like that, you know, um, trying to get people loosened up so they'll talk more. That's a sign of a potential infiltrator. And if they are, you know, uh, insistent on giving you a ride home. Yeah. Sounds like a nice thing to do. Maybe it is. But it could also just be a way to get to know you better, to uh, develop your relationship better, and to become you, make you a better source. Find out where you live. For their information they want to share. With. To build that bio up yeah. uh, about you. Um, it's not unusual that infiltrators will um, come to meetings, but then they don't participate in actions or events that you're organizing. And that's what happened to me in my first arrest. Uh, it was a protest against medical marijuana enforcement by the uh, George W. Bush administration when John Ashcroft was the attorney general. We had passed some laws that allowed medical marijuana, but they were still enforcing it to, and threatening providers of mm-hmm. marijuana who were providing marijuana with federal, with, law. with federal enforcement. We held a nationwide protest. It began with a protest that we were doing in Washington, D.C., because the East Coast to West Coast, so we were the first. And we were going to chain ourselves to the Department of Justice as part of the protest mm-hmm. and all wear pictures of patients on our chest and such. And the night before the protest, we had our final meeting. Uh, a woman showed up. Uh, she happened to be an African-American woman, a black woman. And she, uh, no, no one had ever seen her before. She told one person that she knew so-and-so, uh, told another person that she knew so-and-so. She wore a hat to cover her face a little bit, and she was there gathering information. Uh, she did not show up at the protest. But the next day when you were doing your practice, well, we the next days. day when we were, we were doing our final run through, because we were getting out of the, of the back of a van uh, wearing um, uh, lock boxes, lock boxes uh, chained together. Mm-hmm. And so we were going to run out of the van together, chain together, and then chain ourselves. To the, so we were practicing doing that at a park nearby. And we noticed a, a police car about a half a block away seemed to be watching us. Mm-hmm. We just kept doing our practices, and then we were done. We got in and started to drive away. The police car made a U-turn and followed us down to the Department of Justice. Yeah, yeah. so she was. And I, I and later I was actually told when I was when we were arrested, uh, one of the police officers. Uh, oh, was there? Oh, yes. That just reminds me what actually happened. On, uh, we had some car problems with the van that day, uh-huh. some vehicle problem, and uh-huh. uh, so we were like delayed. Mm-hmm. And so this cop later on, after we were arrested, uh, comes and talk talking to me in the cell. And he's telling me, "Oh, yeah, we knew you guys had a." Had a mechanical problem with the van. Uh, we were told that you're gonna be you're gonna be late, uh, and uh, so we were we were all aware of that was going on because you know they were monitoring us. Yeah. So he yeah. admitted they were monitoring us yeah. and they were they were on top of it. And um, we figured out that woman was lying because we then checked. Oh, she told me she knew you. I didn't know her. She told me she knew you. I didn't know her. Right. And so it was. And we were so happy to have a black woman join the medical marijuana protest, they didn't question which is a very white movement. Yeah. Uh, so it was like, wow, this is fantastic. So it was very smart of them to send a black yeah. woman in to, to get us. So um, one tactic that infiltrators can use is to be assigned important tasks or critical tasks and then not do them. So that may uh, make an action fall apart or an event fall apart if they don't do that thing that they were supposed to do. But on the yeah. other hand, that's they the other can do side the of, That's the other side of the coin of something we mentioned earlier, which is they become very reliable. Right. They become something you really count on because right. they do it so well. So you can have, both things can be suspicious and both things be something you're aware of. That reminds me of the Peter Camejo um, presidential campaign. The Peter Camejo presidential campaign, Peter Camejo was uh, Ralph Nader's vice presidential candidate in 2004 when I was working with the Nader Camejo campaign as their press secretary and spokesperson. He had run earlier as a socialist candidate in 1976 Mm -hmm. and uh, his offices were broken into multiple times. Uh, and they were suspicious it was the FBI. They sued the FBI, got the FBI in court, and the judge asked the agent in charge, how many FBI agents do you have working in the Cameo campaign? There were about 400 people nationwide working on the Cameo campaign, and the agent in charge said we had 65. Wow. 65 FBI infiltrators. Yeah. And uh, the judge then ordered uh, the FBI to... All your agents have to be out in 30 days. And so what did Peter do? Camille, Camille <laughs> then put an order out. No one's allowed to quit for the next 30 days. <laughs> so and he could so, find out who so all So he could they see who they, who they were, and so they all gradually left. <laughs> and the, the big surprise was one of them was the campaign co-chair. Yeah, wow. So it just shows you how they can be so involved and the kind of the role, how depth. That was one out of six of the people. 
were an FBI agent. And interestingly, when we looked at uh, this issue, uh, the 1968 protests in Chicago, the Democratic Convention, mm -hmm. a few years later, as a result of Freedom of, of Information Act requests, CBS News reported one out of six of the protesters in the streets, many of those who were inciting the violence, were FBI agents. 1,600 of them were FBI One agents. One out of six, and that's that doesn't crazy. even count the Chicago police. That's, yeah. the, that's the federal. That's just the FBI. Yeah. Yeah. Other specific actions that infiltrators can take would be to kind of um, send the movement off course. So one would be to propose these ideas for actions or events or whatever that are very expensive or time consuming. You know, let's rent a blimp and fly it over the city or whatever. Um, or to propose things that are either divisive within the movement. Again, this is where they get that information gathering to find out what, what are the various issues that, that people, you know, are hot button issues for people. Or to just, you know, distract them and say, no, we shouldn't be working on this. This over here is so much more important. And that can be sometimes if a movement has decided that we're going to take a nonviolent approach on this protest and someone's pushing a violent, rea a violent uh, action, mm -hmm. obviously causing division, sending us off, sending a movement off track, creating, creating problems. Yeah. And you also see often that... Uh, there are personal disputes going on mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in movements, and we saw that certainly in encampments. Uh, yeah. It's very hard living outside and occupying public space. That's going to cause very challenging moments for people. Mm -hmm. So there will be personal disputes. But if you start to see the same person involved in every dispute, that's, a, that's something to They to may walk. be going around and pushing everybody's buttons. Yeah. And, and that, that could be a sign that you have an infiltrator. Right. Um, it's common for infiltrators to get involved with the media of the organization. So um, they may volunteer to make your website or be an administrator on the website or administer your social media. And then, you know, some things that they can be doing is putting out messages that are opposite or against what the consensus of the group is. So I think of the group. When, in, and when we surveyed, when we surveyed Occupy Encampments about right. infiltration, that was the most common Tactic. Tactic yeah. was getting involved in the media. Right. So one story, I think it was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, when right. the police were coming to dismantle their camp. Yep. And the group had decided that they were going to stay and sit in, and there were about 30 people that were willing to risk arrest. Um, the person who they suspect was an infiltrator got control of the listserv and put out the message that when the police come, we're just going to leave. Right. and not resist, and that yeah. messed up their whole plan. And a similar situation in Arizona, Occupy, where um, they had cataloged on their website uh, all the videos of police abuse, mm -hmm. showing police uh, mistreating, mistreating people yeah. who were occupiers, uh, and they were going to use that in some of the cases to defend themselves against some of the arrests they did, or to sue the police you know, civilly, mm -hmm. in the civil court. All that video disappeared. Yeah. And... Uh, Again, I think that people they suspect, suspect it that was. that was an infiltrator who just erased all the evidence. Yeah. Um, it, a sign is, you know, tactics are, you know, making... It's very hard for infiltrators to keep their stories straight over yes. time because they're trying to be this fake person, right? right? And so making claims of things that they actually aren't or exaggerating, you know, the, their role in other movements to make them sound like, oh, yeah, I built the website for so-and-so, so, you know, you should trust me to build your website. Those are, those are signs. Another sign is leaving um, for several days at a time. Disappearing for a while? Because they do have another life. And, and then when they come back, you know, they say, oh, I was on vacation or I was taking care of my sick mother, but they don't actually have any specifics about what they were doing for their sick right. mother or pictures of where they were. That, that can start to and that can raise be, your senses. And that, that, that raises that other point, that if you start to ask people questions about their personal life uh, and they start to try, and they avoid it. Right. Um, Change the subject or whatever. Then that's another sign that they're trying to hide something. Yeah. And maybe they don't have that life that they're, they're claiming that they have. Yeah, and then if you notice that this person is participating in actions, but they're not suffering any consequences, they're not being arrested or being prosecuted, that could be a sign that they're, you know, an informant. That's like my friends who my, my friends who were going to protest at the Republican National Convention in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. They were driving up from Washington D.C. on on ninety five. They get pulled over by the police. Everybody gets arrested except for the driver mm -hmm. who goes to stand next to the police. Right. Because he was an infiltrator. Yeah. And so Amazing. That was, the driver. You know, immunity from arrest and prosecution. The someone you can trust enough to drive you right. ends up being the infiltrator. Right. 
Now, um, with social media, there's a whole new kind of impacts on, on infiltration. And one of those is that people now participate or try to get involved in movements um, by contacting you through social media. Or they can also work to sow division or distrust within a group or, or, gather or information. attack all, a person. All or, the tactics that we talk about are used in face-to-face -face right. or, or can also be done on social media. Exactly. And you can create a lot of attacks and really get division going, especially then other social media personalities right. join in those attacks. Right. That's necessarily people you know. And so you get a whole thing going back and forth with multiple people criticizing someone for something that may not even be true. And yeah. it's a very challenging situation. Because you have no way of verifying. And it's, or well, it's you, hard to. There are cha it's challenging also because you're not face-to-face. -face. Right. I mean, face-to-face -face you have some ability to kind of get indications uh, you know from that face-to-face -face meeting right. how they interact with people what their body language is etc right. when you're talking about social media all you're seeing is a, a tweet or right. a Facebook post yeah. uh, and it, it's much makes, makes it much there are still techniques you can use we'll talk about right. but it makes it makes it more difficult but it could be the personality on social Again. media it could be a fake personality it could be what's called a troll so um, Corporations do hire people basically just to get out there on social media and, you know, put, do whatever their agenda is. And often it's, you know, trying to cause disruption or division or, or discredit people. But there are things you can do. Right. Uh, and uh, one thing you do is uh, people use photos on social media. Right. And so you're able to track those photos. Uh, look back and see where that where did that photo come from. Where was that photo used before? And so that's an opportunity to to check with that. You can also look at their social media. How long has their Facebook page existed? How right. long has their Twitter page existed? How right. many followers do they have? Right. Why do they have so few followers? Why do they have so many followers? Right. And so you can get lots of information just by looking closely in a kind of a inquisitive way. Yeah. Uh, and trying to understand uh, what what people are uh, where they're coming from, what they're doing, what their history is. Are they real? It happens to me on um, Twitter sometimes. Somebody will make a, a comment that's antagonistic of some sort or yeah. trying to discredit me. And then when I look at who they are, I see that they may not even have a profile picture, that um, they have, you know, like seven followers. And then I know that this is probably somebody that's just there to cause trouble. And I don't bother with it. I don't go, you know, further on that. Or I may block them. I think blocking, I, I, I have become more quick to block than I used to be. I used to really hold back on blocking people. But when people come into my uh, social media and are there to cause division, uh, raise really idiotic comments and just to have a, a silly fight over stuff and mm -hmm. waste, waste people's time, I block much more quickly than I used to. I think it, there's no need for that. It doesn't really help. Sometimes I'll leave someone who I think is a raising questions in a, in a, very nice foil as, a, as someone who just wants to, to debate right. and to, to show other people can read the debate because right. that's an educational tool but other right. times it's, it becomes very obvious you can see when it's counterproductive just there to cause trouble yeah. and, I, and I get rid of them quickly right and so um, it's important on social media to um, think about how you use it uh, what information are you putting out there it's really important to ask before you're doing a direct action ask the participants do they want their names out there? Do they want their photos out there? And make sure that you respect that because they could be facing legal consequences uh, for what they're doing and you don't want to be giving that information to uh, law enforcement. But also just what are your practices? Um, you know, on Facebook, you can create private groups that are, you know, by yes. approval only right. um, to have discussions about sensitive information. Um, you may have chat, you know, groups using whatever tools you're using um, that may be limited only to people that you know or that other people can vouch for when you're talking about sensitive information. So you can, you can have a security culture on on social media, too. Exactly. You can have a broad group where people, lots of people can open to people to come in. Right. Uh, you can still monitor that for troublemakers that, you, that is causing division. Mm -hmm. And then you can have a smaller group that's more security focused on just the people involved in a particular action. Right. And that's by invitation only. So you can also use uh, you know, security culture there. And then, of course, you have the ability on social media to check someone's history. There's a, a link there to allmytweets.net so you can see mm -hmm. what people are tweeting, what their history is, and get a better understanding of where they're coming from. Go back at their Facebook page and look at, you know, do they know people that you know? Although um, there have been situations where people um, would go and, like, 
request to be friends with a lot of people that like that I knew so yes. they could build up their credibility. Right. Um, so you, you have to watch that as well. So there's some basic things that you can do in your organization to try to prevent infiltration. And a very common one is when a new person... Well, a lot of these things are just good practices right. for how to deal with people, build relationships right. uh, in, in, in your organization or in your movement or in your encampment. So a basic thing that you can do is when someone new comes into your group, um, you know, go and meet with them face-to-face, talk to them, find out more about who they are. Welcome them. Are. Welcome them, find out where they came from, why are they here, what do they care about. Um, I remember when we did one of our action camps against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it was very obvious, it was out there that I was one of the main organizers. One of my main issues is single-payer health care. It was also out there that Code Pink was a partner, and they were helping um, you know, with, with the actions that we were doing. And this new person came in on one of the days. And I, you know, pulled him aside, sat down, started chatting with him. Oh, you know, why are you here? What do you, you know? And he's like, well, I really care about single payer health care and drones. And I'm thinking, those really have nothing to do with each other. And one is my main issue and one is Code Pink's main issue. So this guy is suspicious to me. And so um, we had an art group that was painting some props that we were going to use. And I just said, okay, maybe you could help us out by painting. That would be a huge help. And um, he left. And that was, a, that's a, a that, that, that was also a good example of security culture. Yeah. Not only the uh, welcoming, right. uh, which is good to do anyway, but also, we had multiple tasks. We had we had multiple events going on. This is a, a camp that was playing a series of actions right. around the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right. One of the actions was high security. Right. We were going to take over the U.S. Trade Representatives Building. We're going to climb uh, on the building. Climb and on it. Banners. Drop banners all over it to yeah. expose their secret trade agreement. Right across the street from the White House. Right across the White House, heavily policed area. Right. Police substations every half a block. So they were right in the middle of the day. Right at noon. Yeah. Uh, so we were very security conscious about it. So and we had other events where we were doing public events. We had like a, a TPP train. Right. That uh, we were making for a march. And we we're going to march through the whole city to expose the Trans-Pacific Partnership right. that way. And right. that's what you sent the, them to go paint. Right. Help to paint part of the train right. uh, but we had it so he did that but there was a smaller group that did the high security event. but not nobody at the camp except for the people that were participating in the action at the u.s trade rep office knew about what the action was at the u.s trade rep office so right. we were very careful about that um and and it wasn't until the next morning that we told people this is what time and where you need to meet us. Right. And, and even then they didn't know what they were meeting for. Right. Um, but we had one person who was with them who once we had deployed our banners could bring them up to join. There was a group that came up to ch- to, to protest yeah. when the banners roll up. So it was a you know it was a, it's a good example I think of whether it's face to face organizing or online organizing security cult very open, very broad. Let everyone know what you're doing when, on some aspects, but if there's something that needs a security culture, you now have that narrow space right. marked out right. where you can focus on that. Right, and that that's protective both ways because the more that someone knows about an action where you're breaking the law, the more that um, they can be put at risk or they can be brought in to testify when, when they don't want to have to do that. You know, So it protects both sides. Um, a common thing I think is really great to do when a new activist comes in and they're enthusiastic would be to do a, a video interview yes. with them and say, hey, can I just, you know, we're so excited that you're here. Could I just do a short interview? So Again, this talk- is not just for infiltration purposes. Right, right, right. You could do it anyway, but, you know, talk about why you're excited about this issue. And if yeah. they decline to do that, maybe a good sign that they're, um, that they don't want to be on camera. That's right. And same kind of thing was talking with them in more detail about their personal life, where they go to school. What part of town they live in? Are they married or do they have kids? Uh, you know, just in personal questions because as you, you get to know the person, but also it's an opportunity to uh, down the road uh, see if what they're saying, if their story is consistent. Right. Because they may tell something different to somebody else. And right. so it's hard to keep your story consistent when, you, when you're playing a different role. And so that brings us into these next two um, things that you can do. One is observing. So observing who they hang out with, who they come with. How do they get there? 
Um, you know, is that consistent with their story? Are you telling that are they telling you they've been unemployed for a long time, but they're you know driving a really nice car? Or... Did they did they block two? Did they park two blocks away, three blocks away to right. hide their car? Right. I've we've seen that happen before too. Right. Uh, so people hide some things, in, or so observing what they're hiding, observing how they're acting is a and that's another just basic good thing to do in organizing a movement. You want to then when you start to know things about them. Um, you can also verify things about if you, them. Yeah, if you have suspicions. If you have suspicions. Uh, you know, Do they hey, really bring, know that person? Hey, you should bring your wife to one of these events. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's have her, maybe she wants to participate. What, right. what, what's she good at? Right, this uh, is a family-friendly event. Why don't your kids come and do face painting or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you can just you know, really start to verify whether they, their story is a true story or not. And checking out, verifying with other activists, um, other organizations, if they've had any experience. Social capital is really important. Um, do other people know that person? Do they trust that person? And we, we did have an infiltrator at uh, Freedom Plaza and Occupy who had been in, in, an infiltrator at another camp. Right. And had been kicked out, and uh, people showed us his picture, and that helped us know, oh, this guy might be, might, 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 might be a problem. Yeah. And then finally, within your organization, putting in place practices to um, protect. And so just the way that you do things. Um, when a new person comes in, uh, they may say, hey, I'm a great videographer, editor, I'm a great website designer, I'm a great press release writer. That doesn't mean that you give them immediate access to those things, or I'm an accountant. You don't give them your books until you know who they are. So you, they kind of have to work their way up through, and you partner them with somebody that you trust so that person can observe you know, how, they are, how they are. And so you all, you know, as we talked about earlier, you, you want to create this situation where... Uh, New people are working with people who you do trust. Right. And so that you can get to know them better. Right. Train them better. Right. Let them be part of the culture of the movement, of, of, the, of the campaign. Right. Uh, and so that's all just good practice of building a unity in a campaign, but it's also a good practice that tends to show up if there's an infiltrator having a good chance of, of getting that coming out. Yeah. So, um, and protecting information that's important. So, you know, if, if the occupation in Arizona had backup copies of those videos that weren't on the website, then they wouldn't have been a problem when they were erased. Um, you don't so, give someone administrative power over your Facebook page. We've had that problem before. We've seen that problem a lot of places. And, yeah. they, and, they, and they, they, they will not only, get, once they get administrative power, they could also kick you off. Exactly. Or kick the trusted people off. Right. And so they and can't. And you lose it. And you lose it gone. completely. And that yeah. did happen with OWS at County Park. Right. With their Twitter account. That's right. That was That's a major, right. major battle. Um, if you have somebody who's advocating that you do somewhat of a riskier action, I mean, this is always good practice anyway in direct action. We always have a lawyer. Uh, we always consult with that lawyer beforehand. Um, we give them hypothetical situations. What if people did this? What would be the potential outcome of that? What's the risks? And that's really important because you don't want to involve people in an action without them being aware of the potential consequences that right. they're facing. It's right. nothing worse than having activists facing felony charges when they had no idea that that was a possibility. So if someone's advocating something, check it out, or you may need to get legal advice about what can we do to find out if this person is an infiltrator. Maybe there are FOIA, Freedom of Information uh, Act requests that you can do. Or, or public or, public information requests at the city and state level to find out what, what is the police policy on infiltration. Mm -hmm. What are they allowed to do? What are they not allowed to do? Right. And so you can, and that information can be, can be made available. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when an action is actually happening, if it's someone who's new, mm -hmm. it's good to have experienced people with them. If there's someone who sus oh, you're, you're suspicious of, it's especially good to have someone with them. And having that person so that in, in case the action's going on and the person's going to do some kind of uh, violent conflict mm -hmm. or some property damage that's not part of what your intention was, well, not what your group has reached consensus on, there's someone next to them to stop them. Right. Or to expose that, oh, yeah, no, stop. And the police see yeah, you stop. Yeah, that's not what we're That's what right. We're and doing. so there can be video of you saying no, because if that property damage is used against the movement, you can say, no, that person was, we tried to stop them. Yeah, I remember um, one of our recent FCC actions around net neutrality. Uh, it was around the time of the, when the FCC was going to vote on net neutrality, the rules, the new rules to under dismantle Pi. net neutrality uh, yeah. under Chairman Pai. And, um, and there was a letter that was, we learned about a letter that had been sent to the D.C. police, and it was really crazy. By a fake grassroots kind of internet freedom group. This fake internet freedom group. And, and it, it, it had this list of who was, you know, to the police. These are the people involved, and they used Signal to communicate, <laughs> and these 
terrorist groups over here in this other country use Signal, so that means they must be a terrorist. I mean, it was made to absolutely no sense, um, but it definitely alerted us. It that, did bring the police out. That the right wing, I mean, they were fine. It was yeah. a freezing cold night. Nobody wanted to be there. The police right. stayed in their cars. Right, right. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and they came over every once in a while to make sure but we, we, we did be, be, But because of that, we did prepare. Exactly. We had a lot of discussions about if there are counter protesters or protesters or infiltrators that come in and start to do things that we're not planning like to we do. Like we were afraid that you have an infiltrator come in, you have this letter saying we're violent and property damage, and you have an infiltrator come in and, do they, that. And they, do per, property damage. They, they put a car on fire. Right. Or yeah. they uh, break the windows at the FCC. Right. Things that would make no sense for us to do. Right. But maybe an infiltrator could come in. So we were prepared. Right. And a lot of these we're talking about here. Uh, were things we were going to do as far as interview them, uh, videotape them, them observe them, them. Yeah. that we had all sorts of tactics prepared. Luckily, it was a freezing cold night. <laughs> I stayed out all night, so I'm not sure how lucky that was. It was like uh, <laughs> In the teen. teen digits and yeah. snow and ice. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty brutal. Just but... a tip. Hand warmers in the hat work very well. And in the hands and, and, and gloves, everywhere else. And, yeah. your, and your shoes. Yeah. Uh, hand warmers are very key. And then, of course, um, if you're suspicious that somebody's an infiltrator, document why you have those suspicions. What are they doing? What did they say? Go back to as you know as early as you can when they first got involved, because um, skilled infiltrators can start to create real dis dissent and division within an organization. They can really attack people, particularly leaders. Um, issues that are very hot button issues, so issues of racism, um, sexism, patriarchy, and they can start to cause this real internal division and confusion that it can even leave you starting to question uh, people or yourself or whatever. And so the more that you have written down um, what your perceptions were, what were the things that they said and did, and you can see maybe they're changing their, their story. Or and documenting as close to the time it happens. Right. The, the more that it's a record that's kept simultaneously with the events occurring, the, the more, more accurate it'll be, right. the more reliable it'll be. And then you, you know, a month, two months, six months, a year down the road, you'll have those records to go back and say, oh, well, he said that that you know, six months ago. Now he's saying this. Right. And so you can start to see these discrepancies and start to see, or start to see patterns. Right. Uh, you know, right. He, had, so he, had, he, had, he had a conflict with so-and-so. Six months ago, so and so, yeah, and then you know, he's raising this issue, he's spreading that rumor, right? And so, you have this record of all this stuff, and that really makes a gigantic difference. And of course, it should go without saying that these records should be kept in a place you know off site that, um, that other people wouldn't have access to so that they can't you know be taken or tampered with. Um, now, the last thing on this slide is not something that I've ever engaged in, you know, most of the time. When we suspect that there's an infiltrator, it's based on their behavior, and we take action to address that behavior. Um, we don't really go all the way to like, you know, you're an infiltrator, but but um, but sometimes people may get to that point where they feel like they need to set up a situation where they can to document. really prove it, right? Because you have, you have you have a lot of proof, but you're not 100 percent sure, right? And so then you create this. Uh, fake protest mm -hmm. and see how the police respond, see how the infiltrator responds, and you can really... And perhaps you are planning legal action against the infiltrator or the organization that's infiltrating you. So finally, what do you do when you're fairly confident that someone is an infiltrator? We've already said that it's important not to have an emotional response. Right. That's important to have a step back and really have... You, you've gathered the evidence. Uh, you now feel pretty confident that you're, this, guy, this person is an infiltrator. Uh, and and then the, the first step I think is to bring it out in the open, but with a small group. Right. You don't want to have this big fight out in the open in a mass group for the whole movement to see Especially it. Especially because you could be wrong. You could be wrong, and you're it's a small group meeting really is to kind of bring it out, with the confront person. the person yeah. with witnesses, small with group the documentation, provide the proof, and then see what the reaction is. Right. And off, you know, what could happen then if the person is an infiltrator, they'll still deny it. Right. Uh, but you may not see them again. Exactly. They may walk away. Yeah. They're uh, no longer effective. That's right. And now if they if they deny it and you're still not you're still convinced the person's infiltrator, you may have to bring it up to the the whole group. Right. Uh, but again you gotta do it in a very careful way. Right. Uh, this is not an emotional attack. Right. This is we're gonna we explain we, explain why. the issues. Yeah. We've been uh, we started to monitor this because of A, B, and C. What we found was E, F, and G, 
and then we want to present this to you so we can discuss it and see how you think we should handle it. You right. reach, and the group can reach consensus on how to handle it. Right. And, I mean, there's nothing more damaging than making a false accusation and then destroying the trust within the group. Um, you also need to be prepared for situations where the person, um, you know, maybe they weren't, you know, a law enforcement infiltrator or other infiltrator. Maybe they were somebody that was engaging in this behavior, um, which looked like an infiltrator but wasn't. And now they go out and they're telling everybody that, you know, you're a terrible group or you're terrible people because you did this to them. So um, you need to be prepared for how you're going to deal with that in the public and explain to people, you know, what your concerns were and why you took the steps that you did. And that's why it's important to have evidence uh, to have documented it, uh, because you may decide that if you have this proof and this blowback, you may decide to go public with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You may go bring it to the media. Mm-hmm. Talk about the, a corporation infiltrating the protest movement. Mm-hmm. That could be a good story. Talk about the law enforcement infiltrating the protest movement. If the media is understood, the commercial media is understood, you can do it in your own social media. Or you independent can, media, other can independent media. Write, 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 write an article for an independent media. So, But have the proof. Mm-hmm. Hope you have the person's picture, maybe have a video showing the person doing things that were inappropriate. Uh, the record that the person played in the, in the movement as far as divisiveness and rumor spreading, whatever, whatever the issues are. Mm-hmm. So you may decide that uh, you want to go public, even if there's not blowback. You, right. may des- you may decide going public is a good strategic move. Or particularly share it with other organizations so that they know to be on the lookout for this person if they you know, come to their organization. Exactly. And it's also an opportunity for the movement to reflect. Right. To look, look back at how this happened. Right. What can we do to prevent this from happening in the future? What mistakes do we make? What systems can we put in place? Right. Um, you know, how do we keep our passwords more secret for uh, Facebook or other social media? What do we do when there's uh, problems within the conflicts? What sort of, you know, mediation processes do we have? What processes do we have for um, having somebody leave the organization if they're causing way too much disruption? And these can be, you know, a good infiltrator, um, can really cause such strife within oh an organization. Gosh. A lot Amazing. of emotional Amazing. energy, a financial, uh, you know, costs, um, time taking you away from the organizing that you're doing, really upsetting the whole balance of the organization. And this can be really a difficult thing. And sometimes, I mean, we have to sometimes protect our organizations. And so even if somebody is not actually an infiltrator, but they're engaging in these behaviors, we may have to take the steps of asking them to leave the group. Now, I want to caution people because we live in a society where there are are a lot of people who are struggling for whatever reason, who are traumatized. And so uh, we do want participation and we want to be able to, if someone is, you know, your, your first reaction shouldn't be, you're an infiltrator, get out. You know, you want to keep that in your, what I would call a differential diagnosis, you know, what could be going on, your list of what could be going on. But sometimes you do need to provide um, more resources or, you know, specific things to help a person be able to participate more, and you want them to participate. When you do that and the person responds positively and they're then able to participate, that's a good sign they're not an infiltrator. But if they, no matter what you do... They continue to be disruptive or, can, you know, whatever they're doing to throw you off track. That's a pretty good sign that they're not interested in re- resolution. They're just there to just divide and disrupt. Yeah, as we talked about very early in these classes, you know, want a, a movement to be led by people who are impacted by the issues. Right. And so the issues we're dealing with are economic, racial, environmental injustice. Mm-hmm. We're dealing Healthcare. with war and peace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're dealing with issues that create, as you said, trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're gonna, we, we want to have black leadership, mm-hmm. black involvement, and people could face racial trauma. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we need to be aware of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and, and we want to have uh, a peace movement where we have veterans. Mm-hmm. They could be suffering with PTSD. Mm-hmm. Got to be aware of that. So these are, so, you know, problems are going to exist. That doesn't mean there's an infiltrator. Right. And so I think it's important to have ways to deal with those kinds of issues, have a kind of mass-based movement, and create the kind of unity and deep relationships that really create a strong movement. And we did have some of that, you know, at Occupy Freedom Plaza when we had our uh, general assemblies we would have, you know, a facilitator or co-facilitators who were facilitating the, the process. Um, we would have someone else taking stack, so watching who wanted to speak and making sure that it was done in a fair way. So if somebody's speaking a lot that and someone's not speaking that much, that you 
call on the one who's not speaking much. And then we had people that just kind of paid attention to, what, you know, what was going on. And if somebody seemed to be having some difficulty, they could then go to that person and speak to them, you know, one-on-one -on -one and find out what the issue was and try to address that. We ended up creating a whole uh, conflict res resolution. We had a mediation tent. We had trained um, mediators. mediators who would meet with, with folks and try to help uh, when there were problems. But then, you know, towards the end, we were so heavily infiltrated and there was so much going on every day that was disruptive. Um, it, it was, was pretty clear by then that the camp had become not a really functioning. And I think it's important uh, to look for opportunities to educate the group about infiltration. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, infiltrations existed in every movement uh, since the early 20th century, maybe even late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a history. Mm -hmm. And there are books and movies about that. And uh, if you have an infiltrator and it gets exposed and comes up, it's a, that's a teachable moment. Right. It's an opportunity to teach people about you know, how Freddie Hampton, the noted yeah. Black Panther from Chicago, was uh, in, uh, killed because infiltrators drugged him. Right. And so he was asleep in bed when he was killed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so you know, there the history is important, and it's a, a really great teaching tool opportunity for people to know what we're up against, what 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 the op opposition we're up against is willing to do. Right. And infiltration is part of that. Right. And then you know, kind of looking at the broader picture of actions that we can be taking is one is to just campaigning against infiltration against police being able to infiltrate or against surveillance of our movements. Um, Oakland passed a law at the you know city level recently where they created a civilian uh, group that oversees the surveillance that the city is doing. So if they want to spend money on new surveillance equipment, that group has to review it. Every year, Oakland has to provide them a report of what surveillance they've been conducting. Yeah. Um, and I think, then I think also we, you know, we need to think about how we build our movements. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, always going back to those, uh, those broad uh, grand, strategy. grand strategy issues. And uh, if you want to build a mass movement, it's best to be open about what you're doing as mm -hmm. much as you can. Mm -hmm. Open, widespread, share information widely. People get involved, create a deep and broad movement that way. Large participation. Large participation. And then you can, you have, so then who needs to have uh, information gathering by in, informants or infiltrators? Because right. you're already being open about things. Yeah. We're doing uh, work that's in the public interest. We're working for the end of injustice. We're working to protect the environment, mm -hmm. to build a fair economy, to create peace. These are positive things we're doing. Right. There's nothing to be ashamed of. We should be public about it as much as we can. Now, if there are specific things that are risky, we can have a security right. culture for that. Right, to protect people. Uh, to protect people and make it so it's not stopped by law enforcement. Right. And to protect people from being involved in something that's risky. Uh, but generally speaking, a broad, open, transparent movement makes infiltration unnecessary. And another point on that is is that being open can sometimes be protective. I mean, it always depends on that's the right. situation. That's right. But um, if you be if you are a more public figure or there are more people who know you know you and what you're doing um then that can sometimes protect you from you know your opposition wanting to and be violent against you or well it's like when i was the head of uh, normal the marijuana lobby mm -hmm. uh you know we would have uh parties, fundraisers and parties, and people would smoke marijuana in public. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always the first person to light up, mm -hmm. to show it was okay. Mm -hmm. And I was always sure that there were people in the room uh, who were mm -hmm. <laughs> from the other side and that I was be the, I, I, they would know I'm doing this. But I always also felt that, you know, doing the work I was doing, oh, wow, the, the, the director of Normal got busted for smoking marijuana. Well, that's big news. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. It was almost like a protection yeah. uh, to have that kind of thing. And yeah. so it was, a, you know, being open about it and uh, being a leader in that way uh, provided actually protection. Yeah. The other thing I just mentioned from the marijuana movement and the drug policy reform movement is uh, we did have a group called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Right. Leap, Leap was a group of prosecutors, uh, ex-prosecutors sometimes, uh, ex-police, mm -hmm. often ex-narcs, mm -hmm. uh, many of whom had been undercover cops. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to talk about infiltration, those guys know infiltration. And they, they, they explained to me that a couple of some important things about infiltration. Um, uh, one was that uh, a common tactic of really good infiltrators, under, undercover cops, is to become... Uh, 
central to the organization. Mm -hmm. Become someone that's really relied on, that people go to. to might get, drive them to a protest. To get them, like, drive them to a protest. Yeah. Like, who else gets busted except the driver? Um, like, you know, someone who is the campaign co-chair. Right. Uh, someone who you really trust to do things and, right. and become that kind of person. The other thing that they, they point out was that someone who does undercover work well, you're not going to catch them. Right. Uh, they they have they, they've done this before they know what they're doing and they are going to be very hard to catch and so the reality is yes infiltration will happen mm -hmm. uh, it'd be very rare to be able to catch people infiltrating but if you have policies and procedures that deal with the kind of uh, tactics tactics or yeah. symptoms or actions uh, you know then you are protected whether they're infiltrators or not right they, whether they're disruptive personalities whether they have emotional issues whether they're just in conflict with leadership or whatever, um, you know, if you have procedures in place, you, you solve those problems without ever getting to the question of infiltration. That's right. So that's the end of this uh, lecture. We've got one more lecture. Next week we're going to talk about specific tools that people can use um, to build their campaigns and do assessments, and, um, and hopefully that these will be helpful. Thank you for joining us.